Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Establishment, and this is going to be session number 66. Uh, we ended up that last session, we were talking about that in Psalm 139, there are two searchings of the heart that's going on there. That first one started in verse 1, where actually David was going over his day with his heavenly father and telling him what that was all about. Now, I'm going to kind of point up a difference between these two searchings in a way that I think will be helpful. When you talk about those two searchings, and let's just put them on here like this, when David is going over his day, he is praying about things. In other words, he's talking about, you know, thou hast searched me and known me. I've told you all about my uprising, my downsitting, and all the things that are going on during the course of the day. But when you get to the second searching, now you're praying for something. And that's different. Does, does everybody see that? It's one thing to talk about something, but it's something else to ask for something. And, uh, and, and that's really a critical difference between these two searchings. So let's take this back up now in verse 17 just to kind of get ourselves back on the same page and read the, the part of this psalm that, uh, that's going to lead us to the second searching. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they're more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee. I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, now, having kind of read that second thing, I hope that you can see, at least to some degree, and I know we didn't do any work here, we just basically read through it, but I hope you can see that to some degree, there's a change that has taken place from, let me tell you what went on today, to what I'm thinking about now, getting involved in tomorrow. That's really the main thing that I'm after there. And so he's asking God to search his heart and see. And when he says, see if there be any wicked way in me, David is not talking about, I'm, tell me if I'm doing something. You know, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase this. When we see that term wicked, we have a certain thought that comes into our mind about that. So I, I need to just pause here for a second. And, and make this clear. Out of the decisions that you are making in life, because, oh, because you're an adult son, you know that one of the outstanding characteristics of your relationship with God is that you have liberty in decision making, right? And what you're going to be educated in is that there's going to come a time when you've got five choices in front of you and none of them are wrong. I, any of them would be okay. Is it possible for one of those choices to be better than another? Of course. But any of those are okay. And God would call that, He would call those five choices good paths. And He would talk about that being a singular way. In other words, there's more than one path that you can take to go in the same way. And you're going to have the liberty of making those choices. But there's also the ability to choose a, a wicked path. And that the wicked path takes you in a different way. Are you with me there? And what God is doing is using terminology that what, you're, what, what this education is designed to do is to teach you how to choose among many good paths that any of which are okay with Him. 
because they all take you in the right way. But if you take any of the evil paths or the wicked paths, they take you in the wrong way. And by the way, there's more than one wrong way. He talks about the ways, plural, of darkness. So you can go wrong in a bunch of different ways, but there may be a number of ways you can also go right. And you're going to be able to discern, here's how the Bible does it, to discern between good and evil. In other words, God's going to say, here's some choices I consider to be good. You can choose any of those you want. Here are choices that are evil, and I'm going to educate you so that you will know the difference between them. So when you make a choice, you'll be choosing out of the good paths, not just choosing out of everything that you could do. Are you with me? Okay. Now, so when David is thinking about what he's going to do tomorrow, he's wanting to know, see if there's any wicked way in me. Is what I'm thinking about doing going to take me in a way that is not righteous, in a way that is, we could use all kinds of words, in a way that's not good, in a way that's not, you know, you can fill in the blank with any of those synonyms. And so he wants to hear from God about that. He needs confirmation that I'm thinking about this right or I'm thinking about this wrong. And do you know why he needs that confirmation? Because God is not going to tell him what to do. God's not going to pick the way. Now, that's another difference from the way we were all brought up. We were always brought up like this. God, you tell me what you want me to do today, right? And that's the last thing your father's going to do. Not going to tell you what to do. So, you know what we had to do? We had to invent all kinds of little things so that we could determine that God told us to do it. And I've heard, I've heard, and so have you. I've probably said it, and you probably have too. Well, God told me. You know, God's leading me. I never said God told me, but I did say God's leading me. And you know what? God wasn't choosing any of those paths for me. Can I tell the story? This is Mark. When I first called him up, and was talking to him about sonship. You remember Billy and I went everywhere telling all of our family and friends about sonship. Well, my buddy Mark, he had hauled his family from Austin in Texas up to Nebraska. Why in the world would you do that? Anyway, he, he's up there. He's, and, and you know there were some circumstances surrounding that. But anyway, I called him up and I said, hey, look, I, I just want to tell you about this sonship thing and you know, what you do with it is up to you. I'm not going to hound you about it. I'm not going to wear you out with it. But look, I just need to tell you because I don't want you to one day stand in the judgment seat of Christ and go, you mean you knew about this? You didn't say a word to me about it? So here I am telling you about it. But now from here on out, it's up to you. And he listened. Now Mark saw, I mean, we've always had a real good friendship. And he listened. And then he said, well, you know, you know, God's leading me to come up here and to do this thing. And, you know, and he used that, that terminology. God's leading me up here to do this and do that and all that kind of bit. And besides, at the church we were at, we went through the book of Romans. So I already know about all that. Well, I already know how everybody teaches the book of Romans. I used to teach it that way. Which means at the end of it, you still don't know how to labor with your father. <laughs> But I didn't say anything, did I? I didn't say a word about it. I didn't argue with him. I didn't debate it. I didn't counteract any of that. I just went, okay, okay. Well, later he calls me up and he goes, tell me what it was that you were talking to me about. <laughs> so, you know, we talk about it again. He goes over to the website, and of course, you know, he really starts soaking that up. Well, here's my point. He call, on Thursday nights, Mark would call me up and he would ask me questions about where he was. He was trying to catch up with us, you know. And wherever he was, we would talk about the questions dealing with that stuff. And one Thursday, he calls me up and he says, Do you remember when I said to you, God was the one leading me to come up here and do this? And I go, yeah. And he said, that wasn't right, was it? And I said, no. He said, that was pretty stupid, wasn't it? And I went, well... And he said, but you didn't say a word to me about that. I said, no. 
no, not, not my job to debate all that. You know, I, really, I said, that's not what I'm supposed to do. And he began to see it and he said, you know, that was really a pretty nice crutch because then I could blame everything on God. <laughs> I mean, in a way, you know, hey, God led me up here. I, hey, not my fault. But when you realize that as a son, you have liberty to make decisions, now it's on you. <laughs> but that's okay. I, you know, I'm just using that to illustrate that there's a way we all used to think about that because that's how we were taught to think about it. Well, what, what's God's will for you today, Martha? You know, and that kind of deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, and we'd always have to go, well, I don't know, I need to find out what God's will is. Now you realize He's going to let you choose. Remember Romans 12, you're going to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's not interested in telling you. He's interested in you learning enough that you can discern that on your own. Everybody with me there? Okay. Now, so, and David, by the way, in this psalm, is not expecting God to tell him what to do. David has made a decision himself. You don't find God saying to David, go out and kill my enemies. David has come to understand exactly what he is supposed to do for Israel, however. All he's doing is making sure that he's thinking about that properly, and he's going to his Heavenly Father about it, asking him to search his heart so he can confirm or deny that you know, he's headed down the right path. That's the same context that we're going to be finding for our sonship education, because this is the one right here that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. That's the one that's there. And just to make sure you're thinking about this properly, let me take you back over to that sonship curriculum in Proverbs 2, where he says, and I should have highlighted all of these with yellow, but at least they're in bold, you can see. He keepeth the paths, plural, of judgment, and preserveth the way, singular, of his saints. Remember, we talked about this verse a lot last week. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Remember, that's those very things that we were talking about here. Yea, every good path. There's more than one good path. His whole interest is in you being able to make that choice. Okay, now it's at this point that you know the reason God is going to keep that path of judgment and preserve the way of his saints is because there were two entities that's going to try to get the sun off that path. You remember what they are? Evil, evil man and the strange woman. Who is the evil man? What is that? Course of this world. And who's the strange woman? Policy of evil. Those things are working to get you off of the path. But now i got a feeling that even as we say that, I need to make sure that you understand that when you're going to ask, remember it's not happening yet, but when you get to the point where you start asking the Father to search your heart, and let's suppose that here's, here's all of these good paths that really are headed in the same way, asking your Father to search your heart is not about which one of these paths is the best path. That's not what that's about. What it's about is, let's suppose that you choose path B. You're, when you ask the Father to search your heart, you're not asking Him, is B better than you know, A, C, D, and E? That's not, that's not what He's going to tell you about. He's not interested in telling you, and, and, he, and by the way, this is not a technicality. He's not saying, okay, that's a good path, but, you know, here's Ruby. You know, Lord, here's the path I've chosen. Am I thinking about this right? Her father is not going to say, oh, Ruby, that's a good path, but <clears throat> there's a better one. Keep, keep, keep thinking. That's not what he's doing. All he's interested in doing in the searching of the heart is saying, is the path you've chosen one he considers to be good? It's up to you which one you pick. Now naturally, which one do you want to pick? The best one. 
But is he going to tell you which one is the best one? No. Then how are you ever going to know? Yeah, because, yeah, you're going to be educated to think about it like he does so that there's going to come a time when you're far enough along that you're going to look at five options and you're going to go, any of these are good, but one of these is better than the others. That's really the issue of the education, but not the issue of the searching of the heart. Now, I just want to illustrate this in one more way. Because he's not going to deal, you know, I, I just want to make this clear. God's not doing some kind of a loophole thing where, okay, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to keep bumping you and maneuvering you until you get in the right slot. That's not what's going on with that. Let us suppose for a moment, let's suppose that Kendall has saved his money and he knows he needs a car and he has saved $5,000. And that's his budget for a car. Is that a good enough budget for you, Kendall? Okay. I guess. Okay. So he goes down. So you know what his dad does? He takes him down to the car lot. And let's just suppose, for the sake of the illustration, there's 200 cars on the car lot. But out of those 200 cars, he can buy 10 of those for his $5,000 or less. Ten of those cars. But he notices that on this lot, there's a Jaguar that really looks nice. But it's 30000 I mean, he's only got five. But he's got ten cars that he can buy for five. So in our illustration, here's what you have. You have ten good paths. And if he was to say to his dad, but I really like that new Jaguar. Have you noticed when you crank it up, that little computer thing that shows up when it comes up, a Jaguar runs across, it really does, by the way, runs across the screen and, and then everything starts coming up and, you know, and you have all, this, uh, all, all these bells and whistles. He goes, I really like the Jaguar. And it has that deal that if you start to get over in the lane and someone's over there, it gives you a signal and dad, you know you want me to be safe. And he starts to sell this idea. But you know what his dad is going to say about the $30,000? By the way, if you could buy the Jaguar for $30,000, that would be a bargain. But if, if, if you could, if, if, you know what his dad is going to say? That's a wicked way. <laughs> Not because it's intrinsically evil and those, that car model is of the devil. But why is it a wicked way? Because it's not within the confines of the decision he ought to be making. So when Kendall goes, okay, fine, I'm going to give that up. And he says, now, let's take him, let's understand this in the real framework. Let's make Kendall an adult who's got, made his own money, and now he's getting ready to buy his own car. His dad may look at that lot and go, there's ten cars here you can buy, son. What do you want to do? And it's really in sonship, it's up to him. Now, you know what he'll do? He'll look at the one that's sporty. And, out of it. and you know what his dad is going to be thinking? The insurance is high on that car. I don't know if you noticed, but the cars are flipped. You're going to have to replace those things here shortly. Not only that, but the gas mileage on that car is about eight miles per gallon, like a school bus. You're going to be putting gas in it all the time. He's thinking about all these things. But you know what? If it's one of those good paths, here's how your Heavenly Father feels. If you want to buy the one that you can afford that's not really the best of the ten choices, it's a good path and you can do that. But when you start buying the gas and paying the insurance and replacing the tires, you're going to get educated. And the next time you buy a car, you know what you'll be thinking? Yeah, the tires are really good on this one. I went to buy tires for a long time. I'm liking it. What's the guy, what's the, he'll be asking the question, what's the gas mileage? That's what the education does for you that when you come back later, the first time you chose this one because it was a good path. I mean, you could, you could afford it and you got it, but you realize that really there was a better choice out there. 
But you get educated in that, and then there's a better choice to make. And the next time you do something a little different. Or some people don't. <laughs> they default back to the other one. But you understand my point here, don't you? If you've got ten cars you can buy, you can buy any of the ten, and your Heavenly Father will say, it doesn't matter to me, but here's, here's ten good paths. You've got 190 bad paths, but you've got ten good ones. And you can choose whichever one you want. Now, the, the danger is we start worrying about right now you start worrying about, am I really choosing the best of all the paths that are available to me? Now listen to this carefully. Your Heavenly Father is not concerned about that right now. Right now, what He's talking about, I'm talking about you're up to Romans 8, 26 and 27. That's how far along you are. And at this point, what He's interested in is you choosing out of good paths and knowing the difference between a good path and a bad path. That's, that's all he's interested in here. Does he know that there's a better choice? Of course he does. But he's not going to tell you that, and he's not going to nudge you. He's going to let you choose. Because as you start out, that's the first step. You don't start out in math at calculus. You learn numbers, and you learn to count, and then you learn to add. It's very basic. And your father's the same way. He's not jumping you over into very complex decision-making skills, expecting you to have more experience than you have and more wisdom than you have. In fact, if we can't name yet the six components of godly wisdom, can he really expect you to then operate out of them? Of course not. So all he's really after now is to make you aware that there are some good paths and there are some bad paths. And what the searching of the heart is about is getting you to choose out of the good paths by asking your father, here's what, he's saying, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Does this sound right, yes or no? And then you have to be able to expect to hear from him back whether or not to confirm what you're thinking or deny what you're thinking. Okay. Now, having said that, I know I skipped ourselves way over here. I want to take you to um, the book of Philemon because this is the biblical illustration of this. In Paul's epistles, Philemon is the last book of, of the, all the, the books that Paul writes. And it's perfectly placed. Now, are, are you familiar with the book of Philemon? If I talk about Onesimus, do you, you know who I'm talking about? All right, let me, let me just give you this back story a little bit because we're just going to go to certain verses. I'm not going to read the whole thing. There's a guy named Philemon. Now, my, and I'll show you why, but my understanding is Philemon is a fully educated son. He has a slave named Onesimus. Onesimus not only runs away, but takes a large amount of money with him when he goes. When he's journeying on his runaway, he runs into the Apostle Paul. And guess what? Onesimus, the runaway slave, gets saved. And when he does, he decides that he needs to stick around and help Paul. And so Paul's in prison, by the way, when this epistle gets written. And so Onesimus is really helping Paul while he's in prison. And at some point, he comes along and tells Paul his story. In fact, I'm sure it went something like this. Paul, there's something I need to tell you. <laughs> when somebody says that to you, you just know it's not going to be good, right? And he says, there's something I've got to tell you. I was a slave, and I ran away, and when I did, I took some money. And Paul is going to ask him, where were you a slave? And he's going to say, I was a slave for a guy named Philemon. And Paul's going to say, I know this guy. And the slave is going to say, what do you, what do you think I ought to do? And Paul is going to say, 
you got to go back to Philemon. But when you go back, you're going to carry a letter with you. And that letter is the book of Philemon. And Paul is going to outline to, to Philemon what has happened with Onesimus that he knows about his background. He knows he stole money. He knows he ran away. He knows all of that. And he's going to tell, he's, going to, he's not going to tell him, he's going to say to Philemon, I know you have a lot of choices about what you can do, and I pretty well know what you're going to choose out of those because I know how far along you are in this thing. So now let's take a look at some of these issues because I really want to bring this point home. Philemon chapter 1, well, there's only one chapter, but verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. He knows Philemon. He knows a fellow laborer. Philemon is a pastor. How come we don't have slaves? Just thinking. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Kidding. Now I'll get an email about that. I'll tell you what, I just got to be more careful. He's really, cl he has this close friendship with Philemon, and, and, and so he's, he's writing to him, and so, and so here we go. Verse 4, I'm just going to pick it up there. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. That is quite a statement. That there's something about the life of Philemon that can actually effectually work to influence others. This guy really is something special. Verse 7. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. And that's an expression in which he is saying there is something about where Philemon is in his life that gives everybody around him encouragement. Okay, now, now he's going to bring up this issue of Onesimus. And here's the letter part. Let's take it up in verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. Well, let me ask you a question. Is Onesimus his son by blood? You know what he's talking about, a son in the faith, like he did with Timothy. He says, uh, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I begotten in my bonds. In other words, you know what? This guy came to Christ while I was here in prison. Now, I don't know how that happened. Paul doesn't explain it, but on to verse 11. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable. He says, I know that when he was with you, this guy was more trouble than he was worth. But now, profitable to thee and to me. He says, I know how he used to be unprofitable, but now he's not just profitable to you, he's profitable to me. Something has changed with him when, when he got saved. Verse 12, whom I have sent again. In other words, I'm sending him back to you. Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. Now, when he says that, he says, I want, I want you to receive him like you're receiving me. Now, we need to keep reading this passage. Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Paul says, I would have loved to hang on to this guy, have him keep helping me. You're not able to come and help me. He really was. He's a benefit to me. I'd have loved to hang on to him. But you know what? I know he needs to go back and do the right thing. So verse 14, But without thy mind, I would do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. He says, you know what, I'm not trying to impose on you what you've got to do. You know what he's basically saying here to Philemon? This is a sonship decision on your part. I could, I could just say I'm going to keep him, but I know you've lost some money through this thing. I'm going to send him back, and what you do, I want you to do it willingly, not because you feel like you're being pressured about it. Verse 15, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, 
that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me. And how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or owed thee aught, put that on mine account. You know what Paul is saying here? That money he owes you, if you've got to have it, I'll pay it back. You know, I know this is a strong statement, but he says in verse 18, I'm sorry, 19, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Well, wait, I thought you weren't going to say that. <laughs> it's kind of funny how Paul did that, right? It's like when I say, I don't want to tell you, you know, who said this, but his initials are Bob Butler. It's like doing it that way. Paul says, I don't want to have to remind you that you wouldn't even know how to be saved, let alone be in the position you're in if it wasn't for me. Well, guess what? This guy has been just like you. He's come along, and now something's happened to him. It's kind of Paul's kind of offhanded way of reminding Philemon, hey, you didn't start out this way, buddy. And Onesimus, I know what he was before, but now I know what he is now. Now, why is this book important? What, why is it important for Paul to stick this in at the very end of his epistles? Because now Philemon has a decision to make. Now, listen to me carefully. Philemon has a number of good paths that he can choose. Number one, the slave ran away with money. You do realize that under Roman law, he could have Onesimus put to death. Perfectly legal. No one would be able to look at that and say, oh, shame on you. That was the penalty. You commit a crime, you pay the penalty. Or he could take him back as a slave and make him work off the money he stole. He could do that. Or he could do what Paul asked. He could forgive the debt, but take him back as a slave. There's still another good path. He can bring him back and free him, but tell him, yeah, okay, Paul, you're going to have to pay the money back. I'm going to free him, but you're going to have to pay me back. Or he can even do this one. I'm going to forgive the debt completely. Nobody's going to pay me back. And I'm going to receive this guy not as a slave, but as a brother. Now he's got all these choices in front of him. And here's what Paul says about that. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in thy, having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Because Paul knows Philemon, he says, I, I already know what you're going to do. I know you have lots of choices in front of you. I want you to do what you do willingly. I don't want you to do it because you feel like it's an obligation or I'm trying to leverage you to do it. But he says, because I know you, I know what you're going to do. You're going to do more than I'm even asking. Now, you say, is there anything after the book of Philemon that tells us what he did? No. And therefore, you know what I'm taking? I'm taking Paul's statement to be just exactly what he said. That Philemon is going to do more than Paul is asking him to do. Are any of those paths acceptable to God? Any of them are acceptable. But Philemon is able to discern that in this case, this is the best possible decision that he can make. And that's what he's going to do. And so God's not telling Philemon, here's the one you've got to do. That's how we were raised up in church. You've got that one decision, you know. Everything was a bullseye, right? There's only one right answer. I used to have guys teach that. Remember I talked to you last week about the church that was teaching spiritual wives? Remember that? God's got one person picked out for you. Well, that's scary, isn't it? 
You'd have to meet everybody in the world. Talk about, what, what's that deal where you sit down at lunch and they change places every five minutes, you know? Maybe you'd have to do that for 50 years. You wouldn't meet everybody. God's got one place He wants you to live. God's got one job He wants you to work. God's got a certain car He wants you to, to, to drive. God's got one place, one house He wants you to live in. God's got one person He wants you to be married to. I mean, talk about pressure. Just think you just have to get one of those wrong and you're off base for the rest of your life. What, you, what that denies is what sonship is about. You have liberty. Okay, you married a guy that snores. Guess what? God didn't tell you to marry him. That's your fault. Okay, you married a woman that can't cook. God bless you. That's why God invented restaurants. It's a win-win. You get good food and you get to act like you're really just making it easy for her, right? In fact, maybe that's why she's giving you the appearance that she can't cook, now come to think of it. But this whole thing, I'm, I'm just saying is, this is about your ability to make a decision as a son. And, and yet we've gotten this idea that there's this perfect will of God. There, there is a perfect will, but you have to learn how to discern that. So I've gone to all this extra trouble to drive home the point. Because even after I've done this today, if you're not careful about how you think about it and talk about it, you're still going to be talking about God is somehow going to tell you which path to go down. And that's not what the searching of the heart is about. The searching of the heart is about is the path I've chosen one of the good paths that I can choose from. That's all that's about. Everybody with me? Because if I don't tell you this, you'll get to thinking it's more than it actually is. And I don't want you to think about it that way. All right, now I've only got a few minutes left here. And so now I can take a few minutes right here at the end and at least introduce you to the answer to the question that I raised for you earlier. And that is, how am I going to know what answer God has given me? Well, if it was just a verse in your Bible... Guess what? The answer would be the same every single time, wouldn't it? You say, well, what if it's two verses? One of them says yes and one of them says no. How will you know which one to read? See, you're creating a dilemma here. Now, I have to be very careful about this. I have to tell you, I labored. I worked my winger to the bone. I, did, I, felt like that. I labored hard over this because there's two ways to swing the pendulum to the extreme on this answer. And I'm trying to avoid both of those. I'm going to, I'm going to explain this in detail next Sunday, but I'm going to give you this answer now. So to do it, the best way to do it, I think, is to say it to you like this. Let's suppose that you're over here anywhere in, these, in the education that you're starting to get. It continues past Romans, you know, Corinthians, Galatians, it's just an advancement in your education. But you're somewhere in the education, and now you're asking your father, here's the path I'm thinking about taking tomorrow. Is it a right path? That's all you're asking, right? Not, is this the best one I can take? That's not what it's about. And you're asking him about that. It's, his answer is going to come in the searching of the what? Heart. I'm just really trying to think how to do this in these few minutes. Because I don't want you to take this and run off in the wrong direction with it. All right, here. Just last week, a man was telling me in my business, someone who brings me a lot of business on, you know, said, here's what we would like to do. We would like to buy this and this and this and this and this, but we want to put it 
on the company credit card. So when you write it up, you need to write it up as this and not what we actually bought. Because that is something the company legitimately buys. And so they were asking him to do that. Now, see, Karen and Bertha are already doing this. They're going, no. Now, you already know there's something wrong with that, right? Deceitful. Okay, it's deceitful. That's true. There's something, though, that you already know. That it, And by the way, even the guys doing it, do they know it's wrong? Yeah, because they're not going through the company to get that done. They're trying to make the deal with just the guy, right? So they know. So here's my point. Based on something you already know, don't you get something happening in you? I'm just not talking about a feeling, but listen, isn't there something that happens in you when you're being asked to do something that you know isn't right? I'm not saying whether you'll do it or not. I'm saying you know, right? It is easy because it's based on something you already know. All right, now look, with that in mind, because by the way, that's how you're taught to deal with sin in your sanctified life. You're supposed to deal with those things out of your new identity in Christ. And if what you're doing is out of line with that new identity, something shows up in you to go, that is not right. Now, does that mean you won't do it? That doesn't mean you won't. By the way, it'll happen like this. Let me describe it more. As soon as you entertain the thought, you'll be thinking, that's not according to my new identity. You may wind up going ahead and doing whatever that was, and at the end you'll go, what in the world was I thinking? That was stupid. What a complete waste. But see, you knew that up front. It's just that if you didn't mind the things of the Spirit, you might give in to that. And if you do give in, then you'll be, after it's over, you'll be going, what in the world was going on with me? I know better. Now, here's my whole point. Even though you may have wound up doing it, you knew beforehand something was going on with you. Here you are learning the doctrine. And based on the effectual working of that doctrine, what you've learned, when it really works in you, when you ask your father about a right path or not, here's how it's going to work. I know this is going to raise ten questions. I'll answer them next week. But here it is. When you say, here's the path I'm going down, and then you ask your father to search your heart as you're waiting for that to happen based on what based on what you've learned based on the effectual working of that word see it's not just you dreaming up an answer based on what has been taught you if what you're asking him is not right that effectual working is going to produce this thing in your heart that says, that's not right. You can call it a red flag, you know. I know there's a lot of words here, but see, I'm trying to be real careful because here's the two, here's the two pendulum swings. One of them is, oh, so whatever I feel, that's what I'm... No, this is not based on how you feel. This is based on what you've been taught. You already do this. In many areas, you already do it. When someone you leave out of here, you're talking to somebody about the Bible, and they make a statement, and you go, I don't know if that's right. And they go, well, the book of Hebrews says, you know what you automatically think? You're pulling something out of Israel's program, and it's not right. What gave you that check? Something you already knew. You see, it's not you dreaming it up out of the blue. 
It's you out of what you already know. Are, are you with me? That's the way your sanctification works. And it's not any... This also is part of your sanctification. It doesn't work any differently. It's not magic. It's not, well, I'm going to say God searched me and now He's going to give me a... The only time you're going to know anything is when it's wrong. If you don't hear... It be, it's sort of... I know I'm out of time. It's sort of like saying this. Here's what I'm going to do, Father. Do you see anything wrong with this? Tell me if you see anything wrong. And if you don't hear anything, you know what you assume? Let's move on. It's sort of like that. But do you see how dangerous this is without a real understanding of it? Because you'll take one person, one person will take this and say, Oh no, we're, we can only get that answer out of the Bible. Well, my question would be, how would you know where to turn to the verse? See, that's, you can't do that. The, but it's not apart from the Bible. Because it's the Bible that gave you what you learned. And based on what you learned, you're now discovering that what you're thinking isn't right. Are you with me? It doesn't come out of a vacuum. It's connected to what you've been taught. But the other pendulum swing is to say, oh, then however I feel about it, that must be what God is telling me. That's wrong too. That may be the world working on you. Well, sure, it might be the world working on you. You can't dream up the answer. Here's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to trust your Heavenly Father that when you ask Him, is this the right path or, is, or not, that if it's the wrong path, He is going to bring something up out of that which has already worked in you that will let you know this is a wrong path. Mike, yes? Because exactly right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's exactly right. That's why you can't do it yet. Because you don't have anything yet that's been given to you that He can use to give you that check in your heart. Does everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. It's not hocus pocus. It's, education. it's the education. And you're going to look at that and you're going to go, well, you know what? Now, based on what I do know about this, but now, here's the real question. Can you count on your Heavenly Father to actually do that that He's telling you He's going to do? Now that's where it gets a little dicey for people because they're thinking, well, what if he doesn't tell me? He's going to do his part. Now I'm going to give you this last caveat. Probably should not be the thing we end on. If that education isn't working in you, you're not going to get an answer. You understand? It'd be like trying to get the answer today. You've got to go through the education and then when you're asking him about the things you've learned, am I employing this now in a good way or a wicked way? If it's a wicked way, you're going to have to count on him to bring that up and check that. And, and by the way, he's not, there's not an audible voice from heaven going, let me tell you why this is wrong. You're just going to know, just like the guy that said, he said, I told the guy, I can't do it. I can't do it. I know it's going to come. The guy said, well, then we're going to take our business somewhere else. And he goes, then you're going to have to take your business somewhere else. I can't do it. Now, this guy isn't even in sonship. But he knows, based on what he already understands, that's the wrong thing to do. That's all, that's all this is about. Now, does that make any sense at all to you? I know I haven't filled in all the details and answered all the questions, but you understand, this is how this works. It's not separated from the Bible because that answer is coming. That, you're going to have to know what's in here in order to be able to know if this is right or, or not. Okay, I know. Bad place to stop. But there we are. So when we come back next time, we're going to take this issue up because I want you to be crystal clear on this so that we don't get out of bounds one direction or the other.
that we really understand. But you do see, and I'm so glad Linda brought that up, if right now, look, do not go home and lay awake tonight going, oh God, I'm really worried about whether or not I'm going to get the right answer. You can't even do this until we get over into Romans 12. So there's no sense worrying about it today. <laughs> I hope not. He said, a couple more years. Yeah. Well, but you understand, that's something that he's, he's, he's just saying to you, look, this is what's out there. And when you're talking about the searching of the heart, that's all he's talking about is, I'm going to let you know if you're moving in the right direction or the wrong direction. If it's the right direction, you won't feel anything. Now look, look. I know I, know I said it's the end, but let me, let me just leave it like this. You, you pray and you ask the Lord to search your heart, and then something comes up that you say to yourself, you know what, now wait a minute, this isn't exactly right. God will have given you that answer back. You know what you have to do now? You have to go back and figure out, now what will you do tomorrow? When you ask Him to search your heart again, and nothing comes up, that's when you know we're done. Well, everything you do depends on those four little things up there under education. It sure does. It sure does. Everything you do, everything you do is going to come right out of those four. You're going to make every decision based on those. Exactly right.